Could we pray, please? Dear Lord, we come to you today after a day filled with uh, many different activities, thoughts, feelings, etc. Just living life. And we are grateful for your presence, whether we are aware of you being in our life or whether it just kind of slips our mind because we're so busy doing other things. Uh, thank you for being gracious to us, uh, for loving us, and for um, seeing us through life. Uh, be with us as we gather together tonight and try to learn more about you and your kingdom uh, and the mission that you have entrusted us with. So be with us in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're dealing with the third article of the Apostles' Creed tonight, uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit. Um, I have a picture at home. Uh, it is the front of a house. And on the porch in a rocking chair is my great-great-grandfather, Sitting on the top step is my great-grandfather. Sitting on the second step is my grandfather. And sitting on the third step is my father as a young boy. Uh, I've always wanted to try to uh, get somebody to superimpose myself and my son in the same picture as far as six generations. Now, there's a lot of things we understand genetically that are passed on, uh, physical features, etc. Uh, we may hear that we look like a mother or a father or something like that. I know a couple of years ago I was uh, a member of the family. She was turning 102. Her sister was 100. And as I came up, um, the one sister that was 100 you know, she was asked by her other sister, she said, do you know who this is? And her sister looked at me and she said, Johnny? That was my dad. Um, physical characteristics we commonly accept can be passed on. Uh, I had a seminary professor who also kind of floated the theory as to other dimensions of life genetically being passed on. Certain abilities, skills, etc., that we may be predisposed to genetically uh, that it would be similar to those who have come before us in our own families. The reason I mention that is because in the Christian church, we believe in the triune God the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's kind of a tough concept to grab a hold of. Uh, maybe the best way I've heard it explained is that God, God reveals who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That in those three revelations of God, we understand more of the totality of God. There are things about God the Father that we certainly appreciate and are grateful for, certainly the Son and certainly the Holy Spirit. They are different, but they are God. Again, is what we believe and what we believe that the Bible tells us about God. Now, we've talked about the Father, and we can kind of grab a hold of that because we're kind of just used to that concept of that image. Uh, the Son, we're pretty familiar with Jesus. The Holy Spirit's a whole different story. The Holy Spirit many times doesn't get emphasized too much because... How do you grab a hold of that? How do you understand spirit? Uh, it's something that, that kind of just escapes us. And you know, in recent years, we've changed it to spirit rather than Holy Ghost. 
Uh, I don't know whether people were thinking of, you know, Holy Ghost and thinking of kind of a paranormal activity or something like that. Uh, more correctly, spirit. Um, we talk about the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Trinity. Um, certainly in worship, many times we begin worship. We gather together to worship this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, at different times during the service, sometimes after we confess our sin, uh, in what is called the absolution or the announcement of the forgiveness of our sins, uh, we may say again, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we certainly do it again, even at the end of the service, many times. Uh, benediction, Lord bless you and keep you. Lord makes face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You know, we depart to serve in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, baptism. Uh, Jesus said we were to go out and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we apply water uh, to a person's head. Uh, some expressions of Christianity completely dunk them under, immerse them. Uh, but we do that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the only thing that's necessary for baptism. To again... Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hi, Kennedy. Um, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, in Genesis 1, in creation, it talks about the Spirit of God moving across the face of the waters. Uh, different times in terms of the, whole, the, the Hebrew scriptures, once again, the Spirit of God is mentioned. Um, in the Hebrew scriptures, oftentimes the Spirit of God is given specifically to individual people to help them accomplish the task that God calls them to with a prophet named Joel, spokesman for God named Joel, uh, again, before Jesus was born, he talks about that there will come a day when the Spirit of God will be poured out on all people. We get to the New Testament, and uh, John starts talking about Jesus or one coming who will baptize with the Spirit. And we certainly see in, in Jesus' ministry, at times, again, the Spirit is mentioned. At the end of his ministry, he says he's going to, uh, you know, he must depart and he will send the Spirit. Um, we get to Acts, the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, and we remember Pentecost, where all people are gathered around in Jerusalem, they come from different countries, etc. They're there for a festival. And all of a sudden, something happens. There is the sound of a loud wind. And we say, okay, so what's the big deal with the wind? Uh, obviously, it took place in such a way that it captures everybody's attention. It would be kind of similar if we're sitting here, maybe an ambulance went by out on Ridge Road. It would get our attention. Then it talks about there being tongues of fire. And once again, we kind of go, well, that's just kind of bizarre. We never see that happen. But that was a visual clue that something different was happening. And then they start to speak and everybody starts to understand them, even though they spoke different languages, etc. They start to understand them in their own languages. And it was the outpouring of the Spirit at that time. Throughout the New Testament writings, we see the Spirit acting in different ways. Uh, again, empowering people uh, to do what God has called them to do. Uh, the Spirit acts in powerful ways. 
Uh, the Spirit literally transforms people, uh, makes them a different person, really. Uh, and also we hear about the fruits of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, understanding, uh, so on and so on. That these are gifts the Spirit gives, allowing us to live. So the presence of the Spirit of God is very prominent throughout the Scriptures. Um, one way in which we might summarize the Holy Spirit is to say that the Holy Spirit is God in action. God in action. So this is not God just sitting on a throne. You know, we don't kind of limit it to, well, Jesus and the years he lived on earth, uh, even though we believe that he rose from the dead, etc. But the Spirit, you can't quite put your finger on it, but we sense the Spirit and the Spirit's presence, and the Spirit is active in powerful ways. That might be something that we kind of have lost as the church. Uh, we, we don't really think of ourselves that way all the time. That God acts through us in powerful ways. And yet when we look at the early church, you know, we say, well, okay, Jesus had you know, 12 disciples, apostles, etc. And as I mentioned, I think last week was that they turned the world upside down. In a hundred years, once again, Christianity had spread through three continents. And yet, today, many times, uh, we as the church live almost an impotent existence. We don't think we can accomplish much. You know, we struggle from year to year. We talk about our budgets and all this type of stuff. And, and yet, we don't see ourselves as being that powerful presence of God in the world. And that the Holy Spirit, once again, uh, can help us accomplish things that we could never imagine ourselves accomplishing. When we look at the creed, and we have, uh, again, this article, uh, the Spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? In fact, if I would ask you, point blank, uh, do you have the Holy Spirit? Common response of many people would go, uh, I don't know. You know. I don't know. How would I know? In the Lutheran Church, our Lutheran expression of Christianity we believe that the Holy Spirit is given to us in and through the waters of baptism. Uh, as that water is applied, mysteriously, we can't explain it, but we believe that God puts God's Holy Spirit within us. It's God's act. We don't have to do anything to earn it. God takes the initiative and pours that spirit within us, literally allowing us to have faith, giving us the ability to live out a Christian lifestyle. So how do we get that spirit? It's that openness. And we say, well, you know, a, a baby. Well, how can the baby be open? Uh, well, in a sense, the parent's openness the parent's faith, etc., literally just bringing that child to be baptized is the belief that God is going to do what God says. God is going to keep God's promise and that something happens in that baptism. Not only are we cleansed from our sins, we're, we're renewed, uh, we become a child of God. We have to then live it out. It's no different than you know, physically being born. You can be physically born in this world, but there are things that have to happen that you kind of have to you know, kind of grow into your life. Church is no different. We grow into it, uh, but we stand on that baptism that God accomplished something in us. 
Um, when we look at the creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit. Once again, that's kind of personal. Uh, I believe that that Spirit's within me. And we believe in, uh, Luther put it this way. Luther says that the Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. the Christian church on earth. How does God through the Holy Spirit call us? Your cell phone? Pardon me? He calls us through the Bible. Through the word of God? Tom? Through the experience that we live through our life, if we can't see him, we just know he's there. Experiences of life? affirmation of other people uh, I was definition of affirmation. Okay. I grew up in the church I was baptized you know started going to Christian education when I was three years old you know I all the years I was there they used to give out these little perfect attendance pins and they would change the little number uh, my number I had 14 uh, 14 years of perfect attendance um, I was involved in the church I was in my senior year of college summertime uh, store downtown LaSalle come out of a store and here is my first Sunday school teacher Mrs. Myers Mrs. Myers was just a wonderful lady. Uh, aren't words to describe just who she was and what she meant to the church. So we're talking about you know school, and of course now I've graduated from college, and you know what do you plan on doing? And I said, uh, well, I I believe that God is calling me to go into seminary. And she said. I always knew you would. You know, <laughs> I'm going, what? She says, I always knew you would. And <laughs> now, immediately I'm thinking back, and I remember our old congregation, it was a small place uh, downstairs. You had the Sunday school rooms, and you had these wires that ran across with the the curtains that they would pull to separate the classes, et cetera. And our class was in the kitchen, you know, three years old. And one distinct memory I had was I got upset with somebody else in the Sunday school class and I picked up a chair and I was going to hit him. <laughs> and I swiped about, yeah, I swiped about six glasses off the counter and they broke. So that's the first thing that's coming to mind to me. And I'm thinking, uh, like you said, Dale, maybe I needed to go to seminary. But, uh, and, and I, you know, I questioned her as kind of, you know, stammering around and kind of, you know, why? What, you know, what, explain this to me. And she, one thing she mentioned, she said, you were always more interested in the Bible than anybody else I ever had. And I know I knew that was true, because I could still remember the pictures from some of my first Sunday school lessons. Um, I was fascinated; it always kind of captured me somehow. So her saying that affirmed was a positive response, uh, reinforced what it was I was feeling or what it was I was thinking. So God calls us. It happens in different times. It can happen in a, a public place. It can happen when you are all alone. 
And there are instances in the Bible where there are people kind of in the stillness of the night. They hear the voice of God, something within them that guides and directs them in a certain way. And that voice that's inside of us is very important to learn. Uh, there's a lot of voices. Uh, you can turn on TV. We've got our phones. We've got a, there's all kinds of voices in this world. But to be able to distinguish, separate, identify God's voice from all of those other voices is important. So God can call us in a variety of ways through the Word of God, through other people, through experiences that reaffirm. Uh, and, and as we go along, maybe again, we have different kinds of experiences, but it many times takes us beyond ourselves. And when God called Abram and Sarah to leave their country and to go to a new place, they didn't know anybody else. They had to venture out on their own. And I've always found that to kind of be true of life, is that many times God calls us beyond what we think we're capable of doing. Um, ever since I left my parents' house at 18 years old, I have always been places uh, I didn't know anybody. You know, there was no support. <laughs> I was on my own. I thought I was on my own. God was with me, and that was proven time and time again. Um, and you learn to trust in that. You trust, and that trust is very important. God calls, God gathers. Uh, we're here tonight. Uh, different people, uh, different experiences. Uh, and, and, and you'll have opportunities in the church uh, to have that once again and, and in new and incredible ways. And once you experience that, you always want to get it again. friend of mine, uh, Jack Russell, he's a Native American pastor. He's the first Cherokee uh, Indian to be ordained in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, when Jack was ordained in Milwaukee, uh, it was a Saturday afternoon. Uh, we were in this uh, church building. Uh, people had gathered together, different colors, different languages. Uh, the service lasted two and a half hours, and we didn't want it to end. Sharing the peace of the Lord took 20 minutes because everybody wanted to get to everybody else. And when we were in that service and, and singing hymns, and uh, like I said, you didn't want it to end. But what dawned on me at one point was I looked around and I saw all these different people and we were all gathered together and we were one. And I, you know, it came to mind I have a sneaking suspicion this is what God had in mind. And once you experience that, you want it again. You want to try to create opportunities to where you can experience that. So God gathers us together. Um, And in that, we do have remarkable experiences that will go beyond anything that we can think of or imagine. The Holy Spirit enlightens us. Uh, simply means if I walked back there to the uh, light switches, turn it off, it'd be dark in here, turn them back on, the light comes on. Basically what God is saying that we oftentimes, by virtue of our sin, etc., we live in darkness. Jesus is said to be the light of the world. It's as though God turns the light on in our life. And that spirit 
just illuminates. We're able to see things, understand things uh, that maybe we were not able to at other times. And that doesn't end. That doesn't end. Uh, Pastor Dave asked me in terms of you know how long I've, uh, I've been a pastor in uh, 44 years. And you, know, you think, well, over that time, you, know, you read so many books, this, that, and the other. And I will still read books that all of a sudden explaining something about the Bible or theology, and you just go, oh, that's what that means. Now I understand that. You know, it was said in a different way, or, or I just never thought about it that way. And that's just, again, a continual process. So, enlightens us. Last thing, sanctifies. Sanctify is a word that we don't use much. Uh, it's a very good word. And what it means is that God, through the Holy Spirit, is making us into the people that God intended us to be. That God, through the Holy Spirit, is making us into the people God intended us to be. And we talk about that we are born in sin. In baptism, God claims us. God puts God's spirit within us. And it's like God is continually reshaping us and making us a new creation and transforming us. Uh, it can be through people that we meet. It can be through uh, experiences once again. And if we're willing to put ourselves out there, you know, that God will use us in remarkable ways, ways that we can't even imagine. Sometimes I've, in congregations I mention, you know, in terms of giving, uh, that we, when we give outside the, a congregation and maybe we give to different ministries, um, for years I've been associated with a ministry in this area called Hearts in Motion. Uh, went with them to Guatemala a number of years back. And they help a lot of people. And, and sometimes we can't do that physically ourselves. But in our giving, we can allow other people to do it. And they do it as a part, again, of the church. And one thing I've tried to say to people, I said, I, I kind of imagine that, that when we get to heaven and we're in the presence of God and we have the opportunity to interact with other people uh, who've lived on this earth, uh, I, I think that there might be an opportunity that people may come up to us and say, you don't know me. You don't know me. But maybe the money that you gave at one time allowed me to live or allowed my family to live. And we'll go, really? <laughs> you know, really? Uh, we don't know, again, how God will use that. All we know is that there are tremendous needs out there and we are called as the people of God to be sensitive to those needs and to try to meet those needs. God changes us. I grew up in a hometown that was flat out prejudiced. <laughs> we had no people of color. Uh, you had to go to Ottawa uh, to encounter people, African Americans, there was a little town south of us called Depew, Illinois. Uh, that's kind of where the people in that area who were Hispanic were funneled into. Uh, and as a result, I, I mean, like, I didn't really have kind of what you would call legitimate, you know, oriental food, uh, Chinese food, until I went to college. I, I never had eaten a taco until I went to college. Uh, not to mention just having interactions. I finally did through sports because we traveled different places and I played against a lot of different people. Um, and you go to college, it's a different experience. Uh, it's hard not to grow up prejudiced when you're in that type of environment. 
You have certain attitudes and perspectives that many are not correct, but you don't know any different. But by virtue of being able to to get out, um, you learn, you're changed. Uh, how has God changed me in that? Uh, remarkably, is, is that uh, I've been involved in different ministries uh, where I interact with people of different races, different cultures, etc., and I feel totally comfortable. Um, in fact, that same Native American thing, uh, somebody's house and Native American sitting around the kitchen table, I went uh, into the other room and, and they asked Jack, they said, is he Native American? And I think what throws them is like, my last name is Turnbull. I think they think I'm related to like Sitting Bull, you know. But uh, is he Native American? And, and Jack laughed and he says, no. You know, no. And they said, well, he acts Native American. You know? um, so that is how, again, God changes us. Um, so these aspects, to uh, go further... It says that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, after the Reformation, 1500s, uh, Protestant churches changed it. We believe in the Holy Christian Church because we, Lord knows, we didn't want to say anything about Catholic. And then back in maybe the 1970s or so, it was changed back to the Holy Catholic Church. Remember, it's small c. Catholic means universal. We're not saying that we believe, and, and unfortunately in our language we shorten everything. You know, uh, you know, look at Dave and say, well, he was formerly Catholic. Well, no, he was correctly, more correctly, he was formerly Roman Catholic. Uh, we're all Catholic in the sense of the, that universal. That means the church wherever it can be found. Uh, we believe in the communion of saints. Um, St. Lily, St. Libby, St. Kennedy, St. Lily, St. Thomas, St. Zach, Do you feel like you've arrived? <laughs> that you're special now? Yes. We've well, always been special. You know, saints are not people who've gone through a commission and it's decided, well, oh, they meet the criteria and so now they're special. Uh, we are the saints. If you believe, you are the saints. And so when we talk about the communion of saints, that means that we stand in line with people who've gone before us. We have a, a, a special day, uh, the end of October, well, beginning of November, uh, All Saints Day or All Saints Sunday. And that's supposed to be a time when we uh, celebrate you know, those who've come before us. And as I've mentioned before, I, I really believe that I have quite a list of people to be grateful for. I remember all of my Sunday school teachers. I remember, you know, college professors. I believe, you know, seminary professors. Uh, so many people who have intersected with my life that have made my life rich and full. Um, so we are the saints. And when we talk about communion, it means, again, that thing of gathering, coming together. I uh, can also specifically talk about when we celebrate Holy Communion. Uh, as I said, uh, I think uh, some classes ago, there is, not, there is not an event anywhere else in the world that can compare to Holy Communion. To take people from different walks of life, different ages, different sexes, different races, all kinds of things, and that they can come together and gather around a table and receive God's presence. And in that moment, there is a unity that exists that doesn't exist anywhere else. 
nowhere else. So the communion of saints that we gather together, God brings us together and God's with us. Uh, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Why is that so important? Well, um, confession is like taking the trash out. You know, if you uh, stay for a while in your house, you know, you have garbage and it builds up. And as I've said before, if you don't take it out, it does two things. One, it starts to stink. And then if you have enough of it, it gets heavy. And sin is like that in our lives. It builds up. It stinks things up and it's heavy. It's a terrible burden to carry. Um, a couple of weeks ago in preaching, I kind of emphasized in a sermon, I, I said, you know, all of us have things in our lives that, that we wish weren't there. Things that we're ashamed of. Things that we don't want anybody else to know. Things that we carry around with us for decades. And it's a burden. And I have listened to people at times talk about horrible things that they have done and they, it's like they confess it one guy you know 70 years later and it was still tearing him up to be free to live once again when we are in our sin we're like slaves we have no freedom whatsoever but to hear to confess our sins to be honest to be sincere uh to be humble and then to hear that in Jesus, through his death, our sin has been taken away from us. That is just freeing. It's just freeing. Um, so the forgiveness of sins, and the church has a tremendous responsibility. Uh, we'll talk about this next year. But uh, we have the privilege and the ability that if people are sincere in their confession, we announce to them the forgiveness of their sins. We free them from their sins. So that is a, um, a tremendous power we have. Uh, the resurrection of the body. Yes. When you say you have the freedom to forgive, now people back there might not understand what you mean when you say you have given that freedom from the Lord, right? Right. That's what I mean. Some people might not understand when you say that. But yeah. If it's not you, it's to Jesus Christ. To right. Uh, yeah. None of us can save anybody. You know, the only one who can save us is Jesus. And it is through his death that we receive forgiveness. Uh, what we do is announce to people that if they have been sincere in their confession, that they receive forgiveness through Jesus. Um, we believe in the resurrection of the body. I talked about this a little bit last week. Um, in the Bible, soul and body are never separated. Uh, we are a complete human being. Uh, sometimes we think of, of heaven that, well, okay, we've floated off to be with Jesus. Uh, and, and some of that is because what has crept into our world is that uh, the physical flesh, our bodies, are bad. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that our bodies are bad. What we do with them can be bad at times, but there's nothing wrong with who we are. And it is who we are. So when we talk about the resurrection of body, what it means is that uh, the totality of who we are has been saved. The totality of who we are is what is going to be with God forever. That God has saved us completely. Um, of course, we get all kinds of questions and say, well, okay, uh, well, what kind of body am I going to have? You know, am I going to be my 20-year-old uh, uh, body 
or my 70 year old body? <laughs> you know, uh, my answer to that is won't matter. Won't matter. Yeah, the things that we focus on here on earth is not what God focuses on. And once again, to be in the presence of God will be so overwhelming that a lot of other things just will not be important anymore. Um, this everlasting life uh, that is spoken about, uh, the Bible talks about God being in the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, everything in between. And so when we talk about life everlasting, it means that God will resurrect us. And we say, well, you know, what's going on there? I mean, we see archaeologists and they, uh, you know, find burials that are hundreds or thousands of years old and that there's bones lying there. Uh, what we believe is, once again, God is going to resurrect the totality of who we are the bones of the flesh. And we have an image of that in Ezekiel 33, uh, where Ezekiel is taken to this place by the Spirit of God. And there's this valley, it's dry bones. And God asks Ezekiel, uh, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response was, if you want them to, Lord. And all of a sudden the bones start coming together and then covered with muscle and tendons and covered with flesh. But they're still not living creatures. And the question is asked again, son of man, can these bones live? If you want them to, Lord, then it talks about the breath of God entering these bones and they become animated beings. That's a throwback to Genesis when God is creating humanity, that God fashions a human being, but that being is not alive until the breath of God, the Spirit of God enters. And it's a, it's a beautiful image uh, because when we talk about God, we often think of God being distant, etc. But here this image talks about God personally fashioning intimately fashioning and then God bending down and breathing into that first human uh, the breath of life. And so that intimacy continues that as God is with us from the beginning, that God has claimed us through the waters of baptism and everything in between. And when we die, we are at rest in God. Uh, I think I mentioned once before, Psalm 139. Where can I go to escape from you? If I go to the deepest part of the ocean, you are there. If I go to the highest mountain, you are there. If I go to the grave, you are there. Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Uh, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Then he goes through this whole list. And that list includes death. You know, nothing Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So the idea that God wants us to be with God forever. Why? Because God loves us. You, know, you, you want to be with those you love. That's one of the joys and fulfillments of life. And so we trust in that. And we believe in that. Well, they, Well, there was one person who told us. If you're talking about kind of the, maybe the out-of-body experiences or things like that, you know, talk about being revived. Uh, it, we're not quite sure what goes on there. Um, Sometimes it's, it's explained in ways that, uh, you know, the Christian church we would find, you know, relatable. And then there's other things that, you know, are, are, are different. Um, but again, we don't quite know. Uh, I think one interesting thing is that it seems to be that anybody who has gone through such an experience 
doesn't fear death anymore. You know, something happened, something was experienced by them where you know, death has lost its sting. Um, but the Bible tells us, you know, Jesus says, where I go, you will be also. You know, I'm taking you with me. I'm coming to get you. And we trust in that. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and, you know, the emphasis, again, in terms of, of heaven is sometimes we, we hear people express things. Oh, I will be able to see you know, my mom and dad again or uh, my spouse or my child, uh, those types of things. Some people extend it out and go, I'll be able to see my pet again, uh, those types of things. Um, will we be able to have those recognitions? Yes, I believe so. I think that will be very important. But once again, that won't be our focus. You know, uh, this is probably a very poor analogy. But it would be like going to a concert and spending the entire concert talking to the person next to you. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, the person you came to see is up there. Why would you be talking to the person here and not even paying attention over there? Well, when we talk about God seated on the throne, it will be so far beyond anything we can imagine. But again, the one who's loved us, who gave us life, who saved us, who saw us through, then we will see God face to face. And we may be aware of, again, other people, etc., and that'll be great. I mean, we got all eternity to talk. You know, you have all eternity to talk. And, and sometimes heaven is even described as a, as, a, as a feast. And we think of opportunities we've had to gather together with people for a meal. And that's an enjoyable event. Um, and you think, well, heaven, oh my gosh. Well, you know, today I might be seated next to Abraham and Sarah. Or I might be seated next to Noah. Or I might be seated next to David. Or I might be seated next to Deborah. A couple of Debras. Uh, you know, Mary and Joseph, whatever. And we think, oh, there was so much I'd like to ask them. You know, we read the accounts in the Bible, but was there more? And they go, oh, yeah, there's more. There's a whole lot more. But we never think of the fact, and this gets back to the communion of saints, that they will be excited about sitting next to us and saying, what was it like to be a servant of God in 2023? There will be that type of exchange. But again, the focus will be on God. As you get older, you have the luxury of looking back. And you can think of so many experiences uh, you know, the book of John, or the Gospel of John in the end talks about the fact, well, you know, these are written so that you might believe, but there are so many other things that happen, there wouldn't be enough books in all of the world to contain it. And you live for a while, and you, you start to understand that, what was expressed and what is meant. And when I talk about that voice, you know, that voice that you listen to. I, I literally believe that that voice has saved my life at different times. Um, quick. Minneapolis, my parents, they're in the car, showing them you know, the tour. Whenever you live away from your family, whenever anybody comes, you've got to do the tour, all the, all the sites. Uh, on the interstate, go up the exit, uh, cross street here the light had turned green for me and it would have been natural for me to go and go through the intersection and it had been green for a while 
but I got to the top of the exit and I stopped. And a pickup truck blew the light and came through. Now, why did I stop? I wouldn't have normally stopped. I didn't have to stop. I shouldn't have stopped. But I stopped. And, you know, grateful for that. And, and again, so many other experiences. Uh, but, yeah, the things that you recall, you know, uh, uh, children's Christmas programs, uh, being in those, and, uh, oh, my gosh, just so many different experiences. Uh, so, you know, all I can say is, uh, you know, I think I'm pretty well aware of what the rest of the world offers. Uh, <laughs> I've lived it. Uh, I've experienced it. Uh, believe me, it has nothing to offer greater than what God offers us. Uh, not even close. Not even close. Uh, we're grateful for that.